Michael Breslin and Patrick Foley are the executive producers and writers of Ratatouille, the TikTok musical. Uh, I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. It's so great to have you both here today. I want to start at the very beginning when I imagine one or both of you got the call saying, you know, we want to put this together in a month or less uh, and you agree to do it. How do you come up with, like, how do you figure out where to start and hit the ground running with like 30 days to pull off this hour long uh, musical extravaganza? It was a crazy experience. You know, we were lucky to have Seaview and Greg Noble as supporters of our previous show, Circle Jerk. And so when Greg started texting us the night before Thanksgiving to, to float this idea of a Ratatouille spectacular, he was like, I want you to take this and give it the circle jerk treatment. And we were like, great, like that sounds incredibly exciting. We had come across all the TikTok content in our sort of personal theatrical research um, and free time. And we were like, that sounds amazing. And he was like, great, we're gonna need to do it in three weeks. And we were like, okay. So Michael and I were like, that's where the, uh, delegating comes in handy and we were like well we've worked with Jeremy a ton before he's such a genius at social media at the internet obviously at writing and storytelling and so we were like we have to get Jeremy involved we were huge fans of Lucy from six and sort of personally and so we were like that would be a dream if we could get Lucy involved and then she signed on and then we I had known Eleanor sort of socially but we like really admired her for her like um, sort of virality on TikTok and Instagram and obviously her like technical skill and success as a Broadway choreographer. And, and then of course we were like David Bengali. David Bengali is a genius video designer, worked with us on Circle Jerk and was able to take the same basically structure of that show and put it into Ratatouille. Um, and so once we had those core pieces together and obviously um, the incredible music team, um, then we were sort of like off to the races. Yeah, and I would love to know how you both collaborate together. I know, I mean, obviously you just kind of outlined what you were doing behind the scenes to bring the team together, but you also adapted the film into this 50 minute uh, book for, for a musical. And of course, with all the songs coming from, from TikTok creators. Uh, Michael, but what is it like uh, for the two of you collaborating together, especially on you know, writing a book and pruning down a two hour film into you know, a 50 minute uh, musical? Well, we started with watching the original film like three times in a row, like rewatching it, rewatching it, refamiliarizing ourselves with like the amazing writing in that film. I mean, such a gift. That original screenplay is amazing. And then uh, we watched all the TikToks or as many as we could, as many times as we could. And then we were like, how do we combine really slick internet storytelling to get the story into an hour or less with this pre-existing content on TikTok. So it was sort of a dialogue between the original story and the original film and all of the incredible content that these creators had made online. And we had to make really tough decisions about what plots could stay, what plots could go, how we can tell a story really quickly and efficiently in that amount of time, which is when we decided to use Remy as a more substantial narrator, I think, than in the original screenplay. Um, and once we knew Titus was on board, we were like, oh my God, this can be such a specific, incredible queer version of that, which was amazing as well. So uh, Patrick and I go back and forth on Google Docs, on text, on Instagram, on you know the phone, on every platform you could imagine, we're writing on it. <laughs> so you weren't actually, were you ever in the same space when you were working on this or you, um, quarantined. I, I know. I know it was like end of last year when it was happening, but I think we were in the same space for writing the treatment, which we did like two mm -hmm. days after we started texting Greg, and I believe Greg brought that to Disney. And then after that, we were entirely separate. You know, we 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 were working in our apartments. It was the holidays, so we were going home. We did the final read through like in my sister's childhood bedroom. I called Michael and he was at home and we did like the final read through read through over the phone before we could lock the script and send it to that amazing cast. So it was a traveling nomadic like, wild experience. Yeah. And you brought up two of the questions I wanted to ask. The first was, I mean, I feel like it's such a feat to have Disney sign off on this, uh, even just for a one night or 
you know, a, a, an airing special. How involved were you two? Like, were you involved with the conversations with Disney or if not, did they have to sign off on, on the libretto or did they just kind of bless it and let you guys do your thing? You know, Greg Noble is such a genius and he is an amazing producer and also conversationalist. Like he's incredible with people. So he did all the conversations with Disney, with his team, with Carly and his whole team at Seaview. And we came up with the treatment and then he showed that. And it was a pretty substantial, you know, outline of what songs we might include and the tone of it and how the story would be told. But then once Disney gave that initial, um, Disney Theatrical gave that initial okay, they didn't ask to see anything else. <laughs> wow. Yeah, which was amazing. And how about, at what point did you know the casting? How involved were you with the casting? And were you able, to, it sounds like you were able to write, especially I guess in the case of Titus, like write for the performer knowing who's gonna be in the role. So how involved were, were you both in that process? I think first we need to give a shout out to Taylor, Taylor Williams, who is an incredible casting director who we had such a pleasure of working with. Um, this was, I'll speak for myself, this was mine and I believe Michael's as well, first experience like on this side of the, a big sort of Broadway casting table. And it was just mind blowing uh, the experience of, you know, we'd hop on a Zoom with Lucy and Greg and like basically come up with a dream list. Uh, I'm sure Lucy tells this story, but our sort of criteria was just that every performer had to be iconic. Um, and so, you know, taking that as our as our sort of North Star, coming up with like a dream list of people and Taylor would go out to them. And I would say 85% of like our dream cast said yes, um, which is an amazing testament to, to those performers, their legends that they would give their time to something like this at, at you know, at, at Christmas, at New Year's. Um, but, but things trickled in in different, at, at different speeds. And luckily we had Andrew Barth Feldman, who's so amazing, Kevin Chamberlain, who was so amazing. And then Titus fairly early. Yeah, it must've been helpful to have at least a few of the key players signed on. So you knew kind of, especially for the ones that you needed for the structure of the, structure of the piece. Uh, also speaking of the structure, can you talk to working with um, Daniel Mertzloft on picking if you were involved in this piece, it seems like you're in, you had your you know hands in every aspect of the production. But picking from the hundreds of TikTok songs, the final you know twelve or fourteen that were going to be in the show, what was that process like in trying to cull? I mean, so much incredible content from hundreds of TikTok creators into a final score. So it was really great collaborating with Daniel on that because Daniel really is a part of that community and he had been from the very beginning. Like he was a natural collaborator because he was just a part of it um, on, in his own life. So we would, we would talk with him sort of from a dramaturgical writing perspective. We'd be like, oh, well, this is missing. We felt that it was missing an I want song. And Daniel was like, I'll write it. And it was sort of incredible what he did with his collaborators on making that song. I mean, it's so beautiful and amazing. Um, but then he also had a pretty strong idea of the other songs that had a sort of virality about them in the in the trend that were like coming up again and again and again. Like the Kitchen Tango was one of my personal favorites and it is one of the most viral and has incredible renditions online. And obviously Kevin Chamberlain was going to perform in the piece. So we were definitely gonna use his song. It was a really collaborative, discussion also Greg and Carly were a part of it um and Lucy it was and Jeremy I think too was mm -hmm. in there yeah we had a I, I guess we can say this we had a, a dream of of a of a Colette um sort of solo number that never made it necessarily to print it turned into sort of bonus footage um so you know there were there are there were bigger dreams to be had, but we're so thrilled with our collaboration with Daniel. And it was just amazing. As you're saying, we're working remotely. We don't have the luxury of being in the same room with each other. And it was amazing this kind of like understanding that developed between us where Daniel would send us a demo that had the exact same amount of time allotted at the beginning as some interstitial text that Michael and I had just written. And yeah, I think that was there was just a lot of kismet involved. Yeah, it sounds like it, especially because it's a testament, I think, to the book and to the score that it just feels so seamless and tight. I mean, it's a it, you know it's it's a contained runtime, but 
it really feels like it's boiled down so perfectly. Um, and something else too, I mean, it comes from Daniel, but also Macy, Macy Schmidt's orchestrations. It sounds so much like a traditional Disney score uh, and a Disney theatrical show, but it's in an entirely new medium and it's doing entirely new things with, with di you know, different editing and TikTok filters and formats. Uh, could you both talk about what it, you know, what does it say about theater? Where do you think theater is going? Because it really, it is theater, but it's an entirely new form. Um, and it really kind of replaced, you know, what people were thinking was missing with theaters being closed, but it's really pushing the genre, I think, in, in an incredible new direction. In the development of Circle Jerk, our piece that we did in October, we were really obsessed with finding theater on TikTok. And we found TikTok to be in a, like, a primarily theatrical um, medium and one that is based in adaptation as well. So it's one in which role play and role switching and dialogue and song and dance um, are all forefronted as part of the actual you know, platform. So we were really obsessed with this idea even before the pandemic um, when it, TikTok was a fledgling little you know, app in the US. And then when the pandemic shut down, we started seeing all these incredible performers come to TikTok. Someone who we loved was Mary Neely. She is incredible on TikTok, like making all these theatrical viral videos that were really engaging with theater history and musical theater history and putting it in a new frame. So when we saw Ratatouille happening, it was exactly the same thing. So it really was the reason that we decided to like, you know, dive in head first and create chaos for ourselves for a month because we really believe that theater is a very powerful, um, not just form, but also community. And at that time, the community was in a very, you know, bad place. It was a very um, emotional time for a lot of people. And we found innovation happening online. And we wanted to lift those people up and also sort of lend our eye and dramaturgical I to that process. It's so crazy. It's, I mean, as Michael's saying, our whole process, and I think everyone's whole process on this project was to honor and lift, lift up the TikTok uh, material and to, so Greg and Michael and Jeremy, and, and we would always be asking sort of what is the gift that we can give to this community and what is like, what is it that they want? You know, it's almost like, it's almost like, I don't know, they were I don't know. It's we were so inspired by it, and we wanted to do right by them. And so I think to that end, that speaks to why Daniel and Macy and the whole music team really went towards a more traditional musical theater vocabulary because we were like, well, that that's what we can give. And I think what we didn't necessarily anticipate what Michael is saying too is is that they gave us so much too. That that medium gave us this um, spirit of liveness that. I think even in sort of cohabitative theater experiences is oftentimes missing. We can get so self-serious. And what I find so moving about the theater on TikTok is the exuberance and the joy of invention. And we've said it before, but you throw a rag on your head, it's a wig. There's, I mean, Mary is a perfect example. She's in her backyard doing all the characters. I mean, it really takes me back to like why I became involved in this. It takes me back to being a kid in my basement and yet, they're doing it with this amazing technical skill um, and talent. And so I think, I think that was also something that we wanted to sort of take from them in the broadcast by having the front facing cameras, by having the kind of self tape vocabulary, um, but, but complementing it, complementing it with amazing musicians and astounding performers. Yeah, I mean, the whole package altogether is so incredibly fun and joyous, as you're both saying. Is there a single moment uh, for each of you that really stands out as a highlight of the piece or that you're particularly proud of or, you know, just look forward to seeing again or thinking about? For me, it's absolutely Priscilla Lopez's <laughs> performance. Um, I've been a, a huge fan of A Course Line and even A Day in Hollywood, A Night in the Ukraine, you know, all of these iconic Broadway titles that she's so embedded in. And we've said it before, but like A Chorus Line in some ways is like an original crowdsourced musical. I mean, there's such a connection, I think, between her presence in both pieces. And she's like incredibly funny. She was so down, so game and did like ludicrous things for the joy of these TikTokers is amazing. 
I would sort of say in a similar vein, Wayne Brady, I grew up being like a huge Whose Line Is It Anyway fan. I think his mm. talent is astonishing and I can't wait to see him hopefully live on a stage, but it was so exciting. I mean, Lucy did an amazing job working with the actors, but Wayne really brought a lot of his own creativity from on a design front into the piece, which is just, just to say like incredible makeup, costumes, uh, you know, he was doing a lot of amazing work and it was really thrilling, just as with Priscilla, to see him embody uh, the same joy that we felt like the TikTok creators brought to their own work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and finally, I would be totally remiss if I didn't mention that as of last week, you're both um, Pulitzer finalists for Circle Jerk, which you've been talking about. Um, congratulations on an incredible achievement. I want to ask um, what it means that such a kind of you know institutional form and prize is really being adventurous and, and rewarding and acknowledging such exciting and bold and innovative work like yours. What does it mean to uh, the two of you that you know, that, that recognition for something like this? <laughs> it's honestly shocking. It's deeply meaningful. We thank everyone on the committee and their, their hearts and their minds for seeing what we made. Um, we thank our, all of our collaborators. I mean, we work with a huge team of collaborators who are equally as invested in innovation and bringing things into a contemporary moment. And it was a huge day for them too. And we're just incredibly grateful. I mean, Circle Jerk and Ratatouille were both love letters to the theater world. And, you know, in conversation about both projects, I feel like sometimes we've had to defend them as pieces of theater. And so it's incredibly gratifying to have such a storied institution um, agree. And to have the other two amazing, I mean, um, final, or the other amazing finalists, Zora and um, Katori, who want, it's like, I mean, what company? Incredible I mean, company. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh. Patrick and Michael, congratulations again on Ratatouille, the TikTok musical, and Circle Jerk. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to Gold Derby today. Thank, Thank you for you. having us.